calling to order the uh, Technology Commission meeting for Wednesday, January 25th, 2023. It is 6.02 p.m. Ask the uh, director call roll. That's a sheet. Call roll. That's a sheet. Uh, Scott Mead is not here. Uh, Rick Stroke? Present. Alderwoman Eichmann? Here. The Webler? Here. Laura Volusia is excused. James Rayberger is excused. Vajee Serrano? Here. Laura Volusia is excused. James Rayberger is excused. Vajee Serrano? Here. And John Farney is excused. Just be four is excused. And I'm here. Uh, the, just a brief note that um, Norma Kesson uh, had a stroke. Uh, he is no longer a member of the Technology Commission. He, he resigned, so ho hopefully everything is going along with him. And then also Michelle Tischer resigned from the Technology Commission. So we have two open seats right now that if anyone knows anybody um, that uh, would be interested in joining, you have to be obvious, um, make either a note to the mayor or the city clerk, and they will include the application. And then uh, we've got additional spots to Pledge of Allegiance. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> there are no citizens in the audience, so we'll skip the comment period. Review and approval of the August, we'll skip the comment period. Review and approval of the August 31st minutes, which is uh, item number three in your packet. Item is election of chair and vice chair. We have a quorum. Uh, just a quorum. I don't know if we want, want to skip this? defer it. We can defer this. If uh, do we have in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Next item is item number five: strategic technology plan, strategies, and activities. Goals five through seven, which is in your packet. Mm -hmm. Back to the strategic technology plan. I'm having a hard time seeing the board. I don't know if the camera's out of focus or it's my contacts. Uh, it seems okay. okay. Seems okay. Okay, good. That's my contacts. Good to know. Uh, looking at our, our goal, we're now on to uh, basically down to the activities and strategies. Uh, so we're all the way back to goal number five. We have to get, get to goal number 10. Uh, so we're five and six tonight. Um, the goal is to optimize technology network systems. Uh, to support changes uh, within the business processes and services uh, as written uh, for the strategy is to approach technology uh, projects with an emphasis on data integration and um, the only change access to that so it would be changed to approach technology projects uh, with an emphasis on data and process integration because quite often not only are you as part of a technology project changing your data you sometimes are changing your workflows as well and then the activity pretty much stays the same, stay uh, well. And then the activity pretty much stays the same, stay uh, appropriately current with operating systems and application software used by the city as determined by balancing their capability within the city's infrastructure with resources needed to stay current with capital planning. Any stay current with capital planning. Any comments on the, the slight change? Uh, then continuing goal number five, uh, strategy 5.1.2, uh, 
um, to support non-proprietary file types based upon open standards. When this was written, it had a lot of web services. The iPhone didn't exist. So nowadays, a lot of integration between systems isn't interchanging files. It's turning around and using XML web services or APIs. So I updated this a little bit to be a little bit more current. Application interfaces should be based on open API or web services standards, XML based upon open standards. And then activity 5.1.2.1, develop processes to maintain the integrity of digital information systems. I added security to it. So it now reads develop processes to maintain the security and integrity of digital information. Any objections? Uh, goal number six is to improve the efficiency by utilizing common software uh, wherever possible. Uh, strategy 6.1.2 remains the same. System interoperability, invest in technology and elect electro to electronically exchange data to secure means with other government entities. And we just had a broad statement, standardization of software. That's been changed slightly. Standardization of software and web hosted services, AKA the cloud. Nowadays we have far more cloud services than we're installing new applications on the desktop. Uh, and then strategy 6.1.3, target a reliance on prepackaged software. Commercially developed software applications will be used whenever possible and avail uh, available and sufficient. Uh, MozBoz, uh, which is a portal application pushed by the city of Greenfield that kind of like shows bunch of governmental entities, the, the location of all of the entities, the, the location of all of their, their vehicles. Um, at one time, it's been replaced by TELUS, but they still kind of used it. We, that was kind of a hack before TELUS. Uh, kind of was the driver for some of the changes on this. Uh, that would be to change the it slightly target or reliance on prepackaged software. Or, that would be to change the it slightly target or reliance on prepackaged software or web hosted services. Adding web hosted services. Avoid the usage of internally developed applications or solutions. Commercially developed software uh, applications will be used whenever available and sufficient. Again, it's not just. It's not just prepackaged software, it's also web-based software or cloud-based software that could kind of snake in there that might be self-developed as well. Any comments on that? And then goal number six, uh, under activities um, and tasks for year number one, uh, we have technologies and standards. Uh, that's now been pretty much incorporated. I'm still keeping it in there, but I'll just put in a parenthesis. See activity 1.1.4.1 where we, we discussed all the different plans and standards that documents that should be created. Uh, year number two is develop citywide standards for common data formats with the guide with reference to it. And then we have develop a master data sets for used across all of departments. Really not needed anymore because that's been done. Uh, we, had, we did that when we integrated BSNA is our ERP solution for it. So year number three is just Deleted. It's not needed. It's already been accomplished. So year number three is just deleted. It's not needed. It's already been accomplished. What about going forward? Uh, well, that would be just the maintenance of the data sets for it. So I mean, yeah, here would be develop master data sets. We could change that to maintain, but that's kind of what you would be doing as part of your part of your stand. Kind of what you would be doing as part of your part of your standards and procedures. I'm just wondering if you get to the point where Yes, and it becomes a little hack or something too. We would still want to continue to use. Um, well, then we would be migrating the data sets and, and um, how we turn around and set those, those master data sets, moving that from one ERP over to another as part of the migration. So you wouldn't see that going separate ways again? No, I would actually see it as carrying, it, uh, carrying your existing data sets and how you have it structured. Uh, what is your master data? What is the entities that, that are being used inside the organization? Uh, and those entities, a little bit of change based upon the new technology, but I would see it more of porting it. Let's say BSNA goes out of business and we have to port it over to a new, new ERP. The entities would be remain insane and then we'd be doing a data conversion and we would be restructuring the new ERP around the existing entity. And that would That's how I would envision it. The cost. The entities? No. No, the the, uh, the master being split again in separate separate databases. If you would be doing a 
mass the data storage being put in databases that that's not a problem the the entities and the master data that you're capturing and putting in problem the the entities and the master data that you're capturing and putting in the d in the erp system is basically revolving around data that needs to be captured in order to run the businesses within the organization that forms the the entity of what you want to want to create like uh, the various fields on the, the permit you want to create like uh, the various fields on the, the permits that, that you're creating or the business licenses uh, or even the projects uh, that they're taking down in the planning department the various entities that are created around that that's your master data that doesn't change very often unless you have a major you would need to be suddenly capturing new data a lot of the data that we have has been the same data that we've been kicking around basically since we put in real cornerstone ERP system that that ran on DOS and then it went in over to govern and then it went in finally over to BSNA. So for example, the entities that you have that rarely changes. So I guess what I'm trying to get to mm -hmm. is if you delete the line, then there is an underlying assumption that ERP is going to be the basis of your movement moving forward. As you mentioned, if you decide to go away from BSNA, you'd have to look for another ERP solution and port it. Well, here it's here it's not the here it's a task to turn around and develop it that we have in the plans that you have the maintenance of the entities and the master data sets that's in the data management plan here this was an activity that is a subordinate to the objective saying all right year one we're going to accomplish these tasks year two we're going to this is literally a task it's it's not accomplish these tasks year two we're going to this is literally a task it's it's not a plan okay. Okay. That's why I say it's already been accomplished because we that's we're now down to the individuals. We should accomplish these tasks as part of this this outline. Yeah. This outline. Yeah. Okay. And then goal seven. Uh, basically, everything remains the same. Um, and then even with the asset management on part of, of 7.1, we actually have that in place. We don't, it's just a side note that has been accomplished, even though we keep the objective in there because it's necessary. I don't think that, yep, that's, that's it for all the strategies. So uh, we are now going to, we're, we're getting to the end. So we went through probably goals five, the goals five and 10, and then we are done with. And I can say that those are the easy ones, too. Any more discussion on the strategic uh, technology plan? All right. Uh, next item is item number six, the Milwaukee County TELUS Shared Service Management, which is also the next page in your packet. The discussion on this is a little bit of we're reaching a point where Milwaukee County has taken over an import, a very, very critical, important system. That they developed the system, but they're they're running the system. That they developed the system, but they're they're running it. They're running the servers. They're managing the system. But we are now all dependent. All the PSAPs, all the police departments throughout all of Milwaukee County are absolutely dependent upon this system. Yet they make the system wide changes, and they don't the system wide changes and they don't communicate it to anybody. And they don't feel that they need to. And they will even, when questioned about outages and, and changes, will give misinformation to the top executives over at Milwaukee County. We have to now questions is where do you want to go with this? That I'm going to go through a long story of how we got here, describe a little bit about the situation of how we're dependent upon it and then we finally get to the point of how do you turn around and with an entity that basically we're in charge and that's it and this is a very important discussion because we are soon going to be going to GCS which is owned by the county and the county also wants to take care of the fire department's electronic patient care record so the county fire department's electronic patient care record. So the county is absorbing more and more of the technologies that used to be controlled by the local municipalities, but 
they don't want anyone else to have a say in how they play in their sandbox. And when you're dependent upon that, and they are causing, when you're dependent upon that, and they are causing issues and outages within the organizations that are dependent upon it. Yeah, unfortunately, it's a dare say. What do you do? What do you do? And then you complain about it, and it's tone deaf, and you can't even get documentation. So that's the core problem. My, my main issue is, all right, we have a problem with TELUS. TELUS will kind of like run itself until three or four months when it needs an upgrade or change, maybe even longer than that. Then we have a problem, then it's quiet for a while, then we have a problem, then it's quiet for a while. All right, now I'm going to multiply that, which is now a financial system. TELUS is just turning around and getting mutual aid at the police department. GCS is basically how we collect our revenue and report it basically to, to Milwaukee County. That's a financial system. And then we have records which opens a ticket up whenever you have an ambulance visit or um, a dispatch out, out to a citizen, and then you collect, all right, what's your name, your, your doctor, your, your medication that you're on, what's your medical history. You get all that before you get into the ambulance. That's then transmitted over to the hospital so they don't have to recollect all of it. That's then transmitted over to the hospital so they don't have to recollect all of that in the emergency room. And then we then eventually get used this system for payment for that ambulance ride for, for that particular person off of it. So there is a semi-financial component to that as well. The county wants to know that EPCR information from it that as well. The county wants to know that EPCR information from it. And there is some optimization where because they know it and it's standardized, it'll make dispatches and data entry a little bit easier for the, for the fire department. So they're all on board with it. But again... If they screw this up because they're in charge of the systems and they start making, making changes or bad code changes, this now impacts us and every other municipality in, in, in Milwaukee County. And we're not allowed to have a seat at the table. So on we go. What is TELUS? Uh, as I briefly explained, that, ha that provides CAD information that's computer-aided dispatch messaging and reporting to all EMS activities and requesting mutual aid services. It started out as a three-year project, uh, and it finally went live on April 1st of 2022 last year. Uh, the system was originally called FATPOT, acquired several times by various vendors, uh, be before finally being reacquired and renamed by the product we now know it as TELUS. TELUS is a messaging and reporting portal. It receives structured messages from the police department's PSAPs, CAD systems of all PD activity into a single pane of glass dashboard. CAD systems of all PD activity into a single pane of glass dashboard. TELUS allows real-time location and status of FD, uh, P, FD vehicles. Police department vehicle integration is planned for the future. Uh, it links PD dispatch calls and incidents to unit vehicle resources. It links PD dispatch calls and incidents to unit vehicle resources. Issues can then be viewed at a countywide reporting level and request additional resources from neighborhood municipalities and reports all activity both at the PSAP and at the county level. TELUS was developed as a fusion portal or a thick client application that is installed on a Windows computer. It allows customized dashboards and reports along with setting up users and access rights. Then there's the Pro Phoenix CAD client integration. That's the software that we run over here at the police department. Uh, it's now fully integrated into Pro Phoenix. The CAD interface has been extended to request additional units, received update messages, and pop up alerts through TELUS activity. The CAD client and the TELUS messaging relies upon the Pro Phoenix TELUS service loaded on the CAD server and the interopt TELUS adapter that must be installed and configured, configured on each CAD switches to the Madison Central Square messaging processor and the, the TELUS Windows service interfaces with the CAD clients and writes the activity to the ProPhoenix databases. This was a brief example. This was actually created by Oak Creek, because we didn't get one, calls Kevin Koenig, turn around and devise this, uh, basically, what it comes down to is you have the TELUS 
the trophenic system down over here. So you have your CAD client and its database over here. You have the Fusion Portal, the thick client loaded on, on the server and server. This then goes through a site-to-site -site VPN tunnel all the way over to Madison. Uh, Central Square is a hosting company that turns around and hosts. And this then talks to a load balancer, which then is talking over to uh, two application servers, or to uh, two application servers, and then three database servers over here. This was the original setup that we had. We had a recent upgrade where all of this changed, and they didn't let anybody know what this was going to turn around and change until the day came where we had a change IP ad change until the day came where we had a change IP addresses in our site-to-site -site, uh, uh, IPsec tunnels to point to the new servers. And that's when we turned around and found out that they turned around and updated the entire infrastructure over in that. It is a shared service, and it's a shared service that we rely upon. Uh, the police department PD dispatch is a dependent on the service being fully available and reliable in a 24 by 7 365 environment. Delays and messages or drop call incidents will require human intervention by the dispatcher. No, if Telus does radio and do it. So that's always the backup method, that if Telus is down, we have the radio. Uh, this may delay the fire department or EMS service to the emergency location. Mutual aid requests may not be correctly processed. Units may not arrive or arrive late to the emergency location. Dropped or pre over the radio. The telesystem does not respond very well to large emergency events and may require manual dispatch activity. I will repeat that again. The TELUS system does not respond well to large emergency events. What does that mean? If you have, uh, does good. anyone know what the, the alarm, what that means? That it's a one alarm call that means one fire department is responding to it. Two alarm means two fire departments, Franklin and Hales, uh, Hales Corners. Three means three fire stations are involved. We tried testing this with a five alarm call, four or five alarm call, and the database system completely froze up. Or two alarm call, which is the vast majority of it. But if you start getting into a four or five alarm call, the system doesn't respond well. And it may start dropping things or you get things exceptionally late. We'll get to that. <laughs> but yet it went live. Uh, recording of it went live. Uh, recording of the fire department and EMS times may be accurate and the stat uh, statistics may be skewed if you suddenly arrive late or don't arrive at all. Uh, PD systems and resources are being used by the fire department and EMS services. Beyond dispatch, the PD is not receiving any direct benefit. Fire department and EMS services. Beyond dispatch, the PD is not receiving any direct benefit from that. Right now, it's a fire department system and only a fire department system. It is not a police department system. They envision it to do that, but that's not what it is today. Most of the development and onboarding costs were performed under a Milwaukee County, under a Milwaukee County grant. It is believed that grant came from the federal government when um, the Democratic National Convention was supposed to be, be in Milwaukee, and they wanted this in place prior to the convention. Uh, the estimated costs, at least for us, for hosting and services, Central Square hosting costs uh, for $2020,540. Uh, in 2022, 75% so of the year went through. That was $5,808. Uh, we also have a Pro Phoenix license cost of $1,170 for it. Uh, they also have licensing at Central, Central Square. At the time when I created this slide, we didn't have. Would be accurate to say that we're probably paying in the neighborhood of somewhere between $7,000 and $10,000 a year in costs for hosting and licensing. Uh, the onboarding, it wasn't easy. There were multiple failures, uh, both in the, there were multiple failures, uh, both in startup of the project, where the project was closed down and then picked up later on, closed down and then picked up. Initially, only the thick Fusion client was the only interface that was used. Within the project, it was determined to integrate Pro Phoenix CAD to allow for direct input into the TELUS. It was determined to integrate Pro Phoenix CAD to allow for direct input into the TELUS from the main dispatcher tool. 
This required extensive custom code being written by ProPhoenix for the project. Milwaukee County does not use ProPhoenix as, uh, the city of Milwaukee does not use ProPhoenix as their RMS CAD platform. Uh, the city of Milwaukee does not use ProPhoenix as their RMS CAD platform. So the larger pr pr provider in Milwaukee County, um, the, the city of Milwaukee, we're all on ProPhoenix except the city of Milwaukee. They're on a completely different RMS and CAD system. Uh, Milwaukee County uses unidirectional only and CAD system. Uh, Milwaukee County uses unidirectional only messaging platform and requires radio confirmation for shared service and dispatches to the city of Milwaukee. So they can request stuff from us, but when, when we have to get stuff from, from them, it, ha it has to turn around and go over the, the radio. Because we're on the radio. Because we're on disparate CAD system. Uh, the original go live date was uh, to be in 2020 prior to the July Democratic National Convention. The increase in project scope, linking it to Pro Phoenix, uh, delayed the rollout into the end of 2021. Initially, the project did wide version. Historically, the Franklin Police Department preferred being one or two versions behind Pro Phoenix due to vendor stability issues. Pro Phoenix is not known for turning around and releasing solid code. We like to normally be behind a version or two. Uh, integration with TELUS now into Pro Phoenix has forced lockstep up. It's now built, baked into Pro Phoenix. If they want any changes to TECAD, means all police departments have to go to a new version of Pro Phoenix, and we have to do it all by a specific date. That was not part of the initial requirements. After several failed 2021, now I'm going to give you kind of like a historical run of, of issues. Uh, Franklin Pro Phoenix needed to be upgraded from Pro Phoenix 2020 to Pro Phoenix 2020 R2. Uh, this was done on 12-15-2022 under the November patch release. Uh, the PD noted major upgrade version, second major version release that we deployed in one year. So because of TELUS, we didn't have to upgrade ProPhoenix once, we actually had to upgrade it twice in one year. That's a lot of time and effort that the IT department had to turn around and do. Uh, it's a major undertaking upgrading ProPhoenix and we had to do it twice that year, twice that year. Post-installation, PD Dispatch and Fire EMS experience CAD and WAD, WDA client crashes. So the entire dispatch area would suddenly crash with an error at, at any given period of time. This occurred multiple times a day, forcing reboots of the computer. In, this occurred multiple times a day, forcing reboots of the computer in dispatch. This occurred daily from 12.15 all the way to 2.3. Franklin was given custom DLLs to fix this issue by ProPhoenix. An emergency patch release containing the 12.28 patch codes was the patch release containing the 12.28 patch codes was deployed, but initially this did not fix the application crashing. So we had to deal with application crashes through December, July, and February. Telecommunication problems were encountered with the VPN tunnels to the Central Square in Madison. That's 2021 to 118, uh, 130 2021. Central Square made significant changes to their load balancer. Uh, on 2.3, a new TELUS adapter code was then rolled out to all PSAPs, and the adapter only accepted TLS version 1.0 connections. It was discovered that TLS 1.2 still not supported. A second go-live date was then rescheduled for February 1st. Franklin did not authorize going live and voted no due to the inability to use her acceptance test because of stability problems and communication issues. So the adapter in the VPN was crashing and the CAD core was, was crashing. UAT uh, also discovered several critical bugs that required Pro Phoenix to make changes. More outages. There was a major outage on 2-14-2022 where ProPhoenix logged into the Franklin servers at night without PD authorization and copied WDA vehicle information from uh, A third LIGO date was then rescheduled for March 1st, 2022. ProPhoenix corrected several critical bugs and released the new front-end client and back-end client code. An outage on 224 was again received, um, so basically a, a week later after our original. Phoenix was again on the CAD servers overnight and updated some of the code on the CAD servers. 
Pro Phoenix claimed that Milwaukee County created and authorized the CRM. They're supposed to get the police department's authorization and tell the police department whenever they would turn around and log in to the server. They did this completely on their own and then said the will turn around and log in to the server. They did this completely on their own and then said the Milwaukee County gave them the authorization to log on to our servers and make changes. That went over real well. Uh, Jeff Wright at Pro Phoenix VP stated that all PSAPs had to be on the 2.4 code release and all PSAPs had to be on the 2.4 code release in order to go live. Every PSAP in Milwaukee County, notice, we just updated the 2020 R2, a major release, and now they have another mandatory patch coming out in order to be compliant with their new code with the bug fixes. Everyone had to be on the 2.4 code release. PSAP in Milwaukee County to needed to be on the certified release in order to go live with TELUS and fix the stability problems. A fourth go live date was rescheduled for March 31st, 2022. Uh, on 3-31-2022, Franklin updated to the two User acceptance testing was performed at a county le level. Seven bugs were uh, significant bugs were identified that needed attention and remediation. Functionally, they were not critical, albeit important. There were three dress rehearsals that I had before our go live date. The 28th, the 29th, and the to confirm cases due to having automatic routing rules turned on. Once flagged off, they were able to turn around and respond to the messages correctly. Automatic routing rules means uh, the CAD system automatically chooses which vehicle tries to turn around and dispatch. It's not supposed to do that. The dispatcher is supposed to choose which vehicle. They just discovered that some PSAPs actually have that on. On 329, uh, we tried again, and a small and mid-sized emergencies, so we're talking about one alarm through three alarm fires, uh, were able to be messaged correctly. Then on 3.30, we did a large emergency incident of a high-rise fire with 20 units messaging and the SQL servers. Uh, there were significant del delays that were encountered. Uh, Franklin <coughs> FE authorized the go-live date on 401, contingent with using the system, understanding that the new Central Square code would be applied within two to three weeks to help with SQL server performance. Code would be applied within two to three weeks to help with SQL server performance. It was also agreed that um, if there was a large fire, it would have to turn around and be done manually via the radio until they fix some of their application performance issues. On 4-19-2022, Pro Phoenix in New Jersey had issues. On 4-19-2022, Pro Phoenix in New Jersey and India were compromised. This is a Pro Phoenix hack. Uh, and all systems were encrypted with malware. Uh, pro, and we talked about that as a security incident report that, in, in, um, that, that I wrote up and, and we went through that uh, mission. Uh, this did not directly impact the TELUS project. It did halt all software development and customer support until the data centers were rebuilt at Pro Phoenix. Firewall rules that allow Pro Phoenix support direct access RDP into the Franklin's RMS CAD servers were permanently deactivated. To this date, they always claimed that we needed to have it. Absolutely essential. Our contract says we have to have it. After the security hack, got turned off, never, never come back again, and we've been living without it ever since. And Jim, Jim just to for clarification, to the TELUS and Pro Phoenix, two separate companies. They are two separate companies. You're twining like yes. Uh, the Telus code both problems with Pro Phoenix had a right code for the yeah, Telus I, I, product I into that. their, right, their right, system, right. into their foundational. But system. there are procedural issues on on the part of both companies that are oh absolutely. And and Pro Phoenix showed that yes, we had major security problems. And and Pro Phoenix showed that yes, we had major security problems. And the 2022 release that we're going to uh, on February 13th of this year. Uh, so we're going to be going from 2020 R2 to 2022. It's supposed to correct a lot of security problems that they actually have. 2022 is supposed to correct a lot of security problems that they actually have within their code. So with this hack, they went into some of their code and they turned around and found out they had security issues and then wrote a new software release to turn around and address some of them. And initially, Pro Phoenix released very little information. 
Okay, post implementation issues uh, and Prophenix upgrades. Prior to the launch, the Franklin PD was required to update to all full vote versions of Prophenix twice. Uh, tw in 2020, uh, first to 2018 to 2020, and then in, from 2020 to releases. Prior to launch, three minor upgrades also had to be performed. So our usual cadence was completely disrupted by this project, which doesn't benefit the police department in any way. Uh, on 7-1, Milwaukee account, a County announced that it, to fix all seven of these, we'll have to migrate over to Pro Phoenix 2022. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Uh, currently, this is being UAT tested with the development in December implementation. Now it's February 13th is when we're going to that version. PSAPs are patching Pro Phoenix at different times due to minor version levels. Level. The county is now responding to what issues are being corrected uh, with specific Pro Phoenix uh, ven version vendors. In other words, all the stuff that they're saying with the code that they had problems with is now 2022 and everyone has to migrate to 2022. We're now doing it at different times, 2022. Milwaukee County implemented the CAD to CAD help desk uh, when they turned around and handed it off from a project management firm that was uh, doing this. They created their own help desk uh, to, to turn around and deal with uh, moving forward all CAD to CAD issues that would turn around and deal with uh, moving forward, all cat to cat issues. That was done on April uh, uh, 29th. And this reports directly to Milwaukee County OEM. The original project team that brought all of this live was disbanded on 531. Uh, there's a small temporary group working at the county until a permanent liaison. Uh, there's a small temporary group working at the county until a permanent liaison can turn around and be found. A Sonali from the original project team is on that, she's still there, um, but her position is not permanent and eventually her position will go away. Uh, Cassandra Libel is the director of OEM and the times that we have problems and the PSAP has responded to her, I only once turned around and got a response. Uh, Kenyatta Patterson, who is the director of 911, doesn't respond to any PSAP concerns either. Outages that we have had since going live. 9-17, Central Square outage, they were down for 30 minutes, that was unplanned. 10-13, changes, changes were made and dispatchers could not acknowledge messages. PSAPs were all required to turn around and, and reset their adapter due to changes made at Central Square and Madison. On patient pop-up failures, uh, this lasted 12.5 hours and they couldn't get rid of that pop-up message because it was a mobile dialog box and they didn't think it was a problem. Uh, on 11.2, Central Square SQL servers were creating deadlocks with messages all queuing. On 11.4 to 11.17, Central Square said that they were implementing Windows Server 2019 updates and created a day's worth of communication failure, pop-up messages, and eventually full outages. PeepSeps were required to change adapter settings to turn around and circle. So, uh, what happened on 11.14 to 11.17 is it wasn't, we were told they were just doing Windows Server updates. It didn't turn out to be Windows Server updates. It turned out to be they created all new VMs, and then on 11.17, they VMs, and then on 11.17, they asked us then to turn around and change the, uh, the VPN tunnels and where they were pointing to and change the adapter settings the VPN tunnels to eliminate the load balancer because they couldn't get communication to go through the load balancer because they built an entirely new environment. So they built communication to go through the load balancer because they built an entirely new environment. So they built all new application servers. They built all new SQL servers. They didn't give us a diagram. They didn't tell us what they were doing. They told us it was a server update and they didn't tell us it was an infrastructure update. And they wound up creating Three days worth of outages, all from the worth of outages, all from the 14th to the 17th, which directly impacted PD dispatch. So, how do you solve this problem? Well, what has to change? Fix the bugs. There's no formal register right now on what version level. Of
When we were in user acceptance testing, there was a register that listed all of the application bugs known by UAT and that told you what was the status of that bug and when ProPhoenix would turn around and remediate it and what version of ProPhoenix or patch level would fix that particular bug. We have not been given any form of a register on what are the bugs that we report to that OEM group and what are they doing about it and when is it going to get fixed. We just hope that it goes away when ProPhoenix issues a new patch release, which is normally issued as a security hotfix, which is normally issued as a security hotfix. But because it's now baked into their product, it may, it, their, their hotfix may suddenly turn around and fix a TELUS problem, which means we're now going in and reading the release notes to figure out when will the bugs that we report actually get fixed. This is a to figure out when will the bugs that we report actually get fixed. This is a major irritant with this batch. Outages. Any outage in a 24-7-365 environment that impacts PD, FD, or EMS services is unacceptable. The number of outages is increasing. A provider outage is not an IT responsibility to track. It should be up to Milwaukee County to track it because it's their servers and are they tracking them? We don't know. They don't communicate it. Uh, their data center in Central Square is at SOC 2 certified. No one at the counties or at the on that data center and that they have out there, why was it given to Central Square? Why isn't it given to somebody else? Why is it given to the Wisconsin Department of Administration? They got a big data center in Madison and they're always looking for people. Why did they put it on Central Square? What are the security requirements of it? As far as we know, or depend upon the shared service, but I cannot guarantee that data center is SOC 2 certified, and it holds CGIS data. The structure of change control uh, with defined rollback. There is no change control, and they have proven now with their outages, when they implement a change, they don't know how to turn around and roll back. They implement a change, they don't know how to turn around and roll back. They should have structured change control, particularly on a... Uh, shared service system, and hopefully that the PSAPs have some voice into that change control. Uh, we're on lockstep upgrades. We're once a standard. Uh, we're on lockstep upgrades. We're once a standard gold version of Pro Phoenix is determined. All PSAPs should not be required to determine to upgrade it for at least six months. Right now, it's like when Milwaukee County tells us to upgrade the system is when we have to upgrade the system. We don't have a regular cadence that we can so much risk. We want to turn around and delay it X amount of months. We're now required to do it when they, they turn around and tell us to do it. And PD feels that they have no voice into when we get to upgrade our systems. Milwaukee County has that voice. And the biggest issue is communication. Any planned update to a shared service with approvals received from each PSAP. There is no approval process. And right now you're lucky when you're communicated if you're told the truth of what they're exactly doing right now. So how do you solve a problem like Maria? That since we're running into this issue, as far as I see it, there's... Or you get someone sitting on a commission, even if it's a user group meeting, that, that has a voice into the county decisions. Or... The worst of them is you ignore the problem, just accept it as it is right now, and that's where we are right now. Uh, ignore it. Uh, attack it in the press. Attack it politic at a political level, which is very dangerous. And now it's a mess. Now it's a ma major issue of managing perception and messaging on it. But if they won't accept you as part of their process, what voice do you have now? is basically at the ICC, uh, which is the Intergovernmental Co Co Cooperation Council, which is basically a committee of a few members of the state, the county, and the municipal governor, uh, uh, mayors get together, and they voice their dissatisfaction at the ICC meeting. Mayors get together, and they voice their dissatisfaction at the ICC meeting. And that seems to be the only place right now where we actually have a voice when we're turning around and having either TELUS or GCS issues. So based upon a wealth of experience in, in, in dealing with 
worth of experience in, in, in dealing with working with vendors that don't want to cooperate with you or other shared service vendors that you actually want to cooperate with you or mergers and acquisitions that, that you have to turn, turn around and, and try to absorb and you're, you're having issues. How have you resolved or um, at least put some, some form of attention to these issues? Yeah, see, we would withhold payment to the county. If you're a business, you withhold payment until they do what you want them to do as a vendor, right? And you negotiate from there. That's our only reason. And, right. and it's or, only $10,000. But if enough people hold it, then that becomes a problem. Yeah. Um, well, obviously, there's so many issues here. But I think for the the... The bottom line is something big happens that this collection of systems fails. Either it's a five alarm fire or it's a <coughs> outage right in the middle of something big and then and then it has to get exposed to the public. Why did this why did this person die? Why did this? Why were the I trucks hope it doesn't delayed? Get to the point where it gets fixed when someone dies. Right. Well, but why were the trucks delayed from serving this community on a mutual aid request, et cetera, et cetera? So that's going to come to community on a mutual aid request, et cetera, et cetera. So that's going to come to be a political issue, right? It's going to come to why, what went wrong in Franklin. Why did this happen? If it if it happens in Franklin. So your mayor's, obviously Mayor Olson's going to be in the hot seat. Already aware of this. Yep. And I would suggest at a minimum that he writes a long message expressing this so that there's at least a paper trail from a CYA perspective, right? Yeah. Um, and he can haul that out. And maybe there has to be multiple messages every time one. Then issuing grievance to the county exec. Right. Th then there's then there's a paper trail, and when the news comes calling to Mayor Olson's desk, he could say we've had a long history of complaints on this system and their behavior. But that only helps you in the record. Yeah, but that's that's the if anything happened after it's like you know what. This can be yeah, strange, that so. doesn't help. But you, you, I mean, you should have service level agreements between the. That's what I wanted to the, say. The, the a vendor thing to lie with no SLA. Yeah, the vendor being the there the is contract, no SLA. What is the contract? That's the first thing I would look and say. Your contract with Milwaukee County for this service, or or, or even the Milwaukee County contract would be. Well, that that's that's also there, right? Yeah. But but you can at least. I guess we could re one could say. When it comes time for payment, we could say we refuse this contract. We are rewriting this contract with an SLA in it. But your contract is with these, a penalty these, three, these three vendors, right? These hosting providers. It's not really their their problem, right? So much. You could you could rewrite the contract with Phoenix, Pro Phoenix, but you don't hold a contract with Telus, right? No, it'd be us the contract with. You don't hold a contract with Telus, right? No, it'd be us the contract with. Milwaukee County. Yeah, that's our contracts with Milwaukee County. So you have a contract with them because Milwaukee County brought all of this. Yeah, and mm -hmm. all that. so it's not. Yeah. it's not us. So, but you pay. You pay. Yeah. it's not us. So, but you pay. You pay Central Square money directly. Or you pay that we, we you pay yeah, central square Milwaukee hosting county. fees, but we pay it to the county. Okay, yeah. So with you can withhold that. You can withhold that. I mean, that's not a lot of money, but if you all gang up on them, um, or a subsection of the municipalities can come together and say, "Look, this isn't." One thought no longer accept some of the other uh, PSAPs. Or accept some of the other uh, PSAPs, my, my peers uh, in other municipalities, yeah. is when they turn around and tell us, oh, we want to bring the police department in on this, <laughs> tell them to go jump into Lake Michigan and refuse until they turn around and start putting the SLA in. 
absolutely the SLA in. Absolutely. And giving us shared governance. Um, I don't see how... Until they do that, the answer is a firm no. I don't see how the police department could come on a system like this no. if it can't handle a five-alarm fire. Uh, because five-alarm fire, in my mind, has a lot less messaging. Yep. You know, now, cars and records and everything. Even though we're being recorded on this, it is the belief. Again, this is a perception. And I, I, I somewhat agree with this perception. I don't think it's, it's that far off. One of the major beneficiaries of this system, beyond Milwaukee County with the reporting, closed for budgetary purposes almost all the police, all the fire departments. Mm. And they don't even send emergency vehicles uh, into certain areas of the inner city because of danger. They actually use um, two ambulance services. One I know is Bell. Out there, and they they have third party contract batches in, in these areas. Milwaukee City, Milwaukee is not in good financial condition, and part of what they're doing is they're using munici municipal aid to turn around and help subsidize having additional cops and fire and firefighters. Well, wow. uh, ultimately, on their you're payroll, mutual aid, 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 mutual aid, right? That's that's the ultimate. Now, with mutual um, aid, gotcha. you can always say no, but you try not to. I know. As much as you yeah, possibly big, can on there's that. There's big risk there. But it comes down to the For point of when, when does it come one person's being piggish and the other people and the other people are not. Yeah. When do you get when do you get a pig at the buffet? But that but that's beyond IT, right? Yeah, I that's mean, that that's is, beyond yeah. IT, but that's also another driver of why they wanted this. Yeah. I and also think you you've got it. pro Phoenix that you need to, you know, curtail uh, get under a a better SLA, you know, curtail, uh, get under a, a better SLA. Now they are at the, they are also at the they are at mercy the of what is happening with TELUS, right? If TELUS upgrades, they got to upgrade. I mean, they, they're, they're also probably not great. I mean, they, they're, they're also probably not exactly in the best position here because they have to keep and the yeah. PD has always had issues with Pro Phoenix and their servers and their reliability. Yeah. But that's kind of like a bad marriage, that you, you kind of like stuck, divorce is messy on it. You try as much as you can to influence positive changes at Pro Phoenix, try to get it better. One of the things we've learned through, through the course of action is you don't update to a new system until... A lot of our peers have yep. tested it on their test systems because some of them are very good and know the system has no uh, audit. And then instead of doing an in-place upgrade, we turn around and pay the cash and we do an upgrade onto a, a parallel environment that's virgin clean. So we build a brand new VM with a brand new operating system, update to that. Those type of migrations seem to go a lot better than the migrations seem to go a lot better than the cobbled code that they have when they try to do an in-place upgrade. Sure. So, to summarize, Go ahead. it's make sure that, we, make sure that we are communicating with these things on a regular basis to the mayor mm -hmm. uh, and so that he has uh, talking points. Um, and he should be constantly communicating up. Exactly. Right. And then secondly, make sure that we are reviewing contracts that we have with the providers, whether they be Milwaukee County or any of these individual any of these individual things. Understanding uh, what our costs are to support the system the way it is now with all the with all these redos versus what we could save if if things were uh, a little bit more uh, structured, had the appropriate one over one approvals and so on and so forth and get it about obviously the relationships within government and this sort of relationship where they say thou shall do this and the municipalities are at the you know beck and call of this mm -hmm. that lower even, on the totem pole that even if you try to put it in writing and you should put it in writing is what you have to say and that's where that's where all the communities that are part of this that's the shared governance even if it's informal shared governance they all need to stand together. Say, you want us to go live for one? We're not doing it. Nope, none of us. None of us. 
Because then, and if they want that to go public in the news or in the media, so be it, as long as there's a good reason for why it's, you know, the communities are doing that, and that presumably is for safety and, and you know, operation. One of the main issues that we actually get with that, uh, turning around and putting some form of grant or money out there, and then if you turn around and say no, then they turn around and try to take the money back for it. So th they'll put some program in, gee, we're giving you new defibrillators and a training program and, and this money, because a lot of the grant money, that grant money that we get from the federal level gets put into block grants to the state. The state then the state then gives it down to the county. Yeah. The county then gives you funding for block grants, then, but then puts a lot of strings on it. And if you don't like one of their programs, then they try to eliminate that, that funding from you. That's why you have risk. Then they try to eliminate that, that funding from you. That's why you have risk if you take the in-your-face approach. Yeah. So you don't do it that way. You do it by doctor. Sometimes you can't. Which works for the fire department, and sometimes works. In this case, it hasn't, and sometimes works. In this case, it hasn't for the police department, but it doesn't work for the IT department that seems to turn around and get run over by a truck by the county when they implement these systems, and they they are implemented poorly because they're taking on this project was a huge. They're taking on this project was a huge, huge, huge. Bite. There's no question about it. Just like GCS mm -hmm. is an absolutely huge bite. And you look at this and it's like, how are you going to possibly get this coordinated with all these people and all these different systems and all these different procedures? And these people and all these different systems and all these different procedures. And it's, I realize it's going to be a rough road. It's not going to be an easy road to travel on, on this one. But yet again, we still don't seem to have any willingness to be open with communications. Just know what they are doing and why they are doing it and when they are doing it and how they are doing it. So we can review their change and then say, well, I would recommend through my experience you take a different approach on this. That may not work. Maybe you want to change your, your, your 14 to 11, 17 issue. We had problems with the load balancer back in February. It's like we knew it was a load balancer. I would have saw a whole change in that infrastructure. I would have asked, did you test your load balancer on this? We should really test this load balancer before we go ahead and, and move forward with moving all your infrastructure. But because they didn't get us into the condition, that useful input didn't get, get moved upwards. And I would love to help them before the fact instead of after the fact, being proactive instead of reactive. But then how do you leverage, really do the lot arm bending to get them to turn around, do the lot arm bending to get them to turn around and be willing to start communicating yeah. where they are. are with the county IT guy. Yeah. yeah. But, you know. Particularly when the be... person who's in charge of the entire bureau just wants to ignore the problem and, and I hand it off to a team of consultants. Just wants to ignore the problem, and, and I hand it off to a team of consultants. I know, but the county executive doesn't want something blowing up in his face. Right, true. On TV, because something happened in Oak Creek right. that the mayor of Oak Creek starts harping about some system not working on TV. So I would think level, along with the county executive and the county board, that they would want to at least have the better minds of the communities, municipalities put together and fix this. If they do IT lead saying, oh, this is a problem, I don't, I don't know that, that that's going to work. It has to be a much stronger body of users with some leverage. That, and that's where I, I think the, the, the leverage is maybe feeling at the mayoral level and at the county exec and county board level that this has to get fixed, right? This is a train wreck. This is not happening, right? There's something's gonna happen here. It's gonna become very public. So let's fix it. And let's put, a, let's put a, in place a shared governance 
some sort of user group to put a, in place a shared governance, some sort of user group that can actually iron these, iron these problems out, fix this the way it should be fixed. And, and that's where, you know, top down, hopefully the county exec assigns someone and says, let's, let's get this done, assigns someone and says, let's, let's get this done, makes it a priority. But otherwise, you don't have a lot of monetary leverage and, you know, Gail and Rajiv and myself don't live in a world where your customers bribe you with money, i.e. grants, <laughs> <laughs> to, to uh, envision because in our world, we would just cease to operate with that vendor or cease to pay that vendor until they came to terms with a better contract and a better arrangement. One of, and we would have that one of the items that was said by um, is not care what the IT managers and directors have to say about their internal organization. They do care when the police chiefs and the fire chiefs throw a fit. Normally, it's the police chiefs and the fire chiefs that seem to get the ears more, more than anything. And it's like, even though there's been resistance, even though there's been resistance because of the funding issue, start throwing barbs out there that we we don't have enough political clout to fix this. This is something that the chiefs have to fix. Chiefs and the mayor. Yeah. Because ultimately, it's their staff. The yeah. Users. Yeah. Because ultimately, it's their staff. They the yeah. Users. Yeah. If they're expecting a fire, and there's a five alarm fire, and it's their staff that's out there, and they're climbing the ladders, and they're fighting the fires, and they're expecting... 20 vehicles to arrive on site and five mm -hmm. arrive. One of those fire mm -hmm. arrive. One of those firefighters is going to be hurt. And that's mm -hmm. not acceptable to the fire chiefs and that's where they have to start bringing it in from the OEM level. Fire chiefs say no. And I agree with that statement too. The bottom line, while we can we can uh, proselytize about what we should do, the commission can't really no can't really. But this is more of an advisory talk about what have you seen? Yeah, bat some ideas around okay. on it, and where should councils turn around and issue some form of, of statement? If it got really, really, really bad, issue a statement of no confidence, and then turn around and throw that. Over to the over not only to the county exec, throw that to the board, county board, and and let them digest a, a, a no confidence county board, and and let them digest a, a, a no confidence vote. I mean, everything you do like that, but again, that's gets very public. Yeah. Well, it is reactionary. You're in a reactionary state at the moment. Um, but it, you do something like that, that's very public. Mm -hmm. um, that's it depends where on where number four is. You fight risk. it through the the press. Um, that's it depends where you get on where number four is. You, you the fight it through the, the press. Yeah. Right. right. But don't forget now what you said before. That is, you do that, that'll create a lot of churn, uh, and it will also put you at risk for any grants. And I also realize when it comes to a battle of perception, <laughs> truth doesn't win. It's exactly. perception that wins. Mm -hmm. And there's there's always the thing too where. Uh, you start pointing out uh, problems uh, with somebody else, suddenly you find out that maybe your list isn't all that clean either. <laughs> well, and there it's your vendor, Pro Phoenix, right? Right? That, that they could come back to Franklin and say, or any of the municipalities, their system's not working right. They're not. They, they, they don't. All they don't it on Pro Phoenix. They can point fingers, right? Yeah. And to tell the honest truth. Um, and there's enough remember that this, incident. Right? I remember that incident out in Waukesha, where there there was a what they said was a delay. They eventually said it was human error, uh, but they they said there was a delay in their dispatch system, and a person wound up dying. And they did this whole huge investigation because of it, yeah. and, and trying to figure out what the heck happened uh, for it, and because of it, yeah. and, and trying to figure out what the heck happened uh, for it. And then, yep, well, the first thing they did was pointing fingers at the software vendor yep. on it, and only to find out through more research if it's true or not that it was not the software problem, it was a human error problem. 
said. The software problem was a human error problem instead. So you are right. Yeah, in that type of an environment, that's the first thing they're going to do is look at any trap door that they can take and then start using it. Isn't it? Isn't it nice to know becoming more reliant? <laughs> Okay, some, some good ideas there, so we will continue, at least from the IT director's standpoint, to continue to have our director's standpoint, to continue to have our, our joint meetings and discussions and make sure that at least our voices <coughs> can give a voice on it, because that, that will have probably the most impact, but we also realize not every community, every municipality has, municipality has an IT department that ProPhoenix has actually turned around and run. Uh, Oak Creek runs the, uh, I, the uh, stuff for ProPhoenix for Cudahy and St. Francis. Hmm. And what West Dallas, uh, no, Wauwatosa, I think, does it for, for Hales Corners. Um, you would have uh, some places completely and totally ignore the problem because they don't have an IT department, it really doesn't affect them. So why, why does Cudahy care when they don't have an IT department that's not getting impacted by, by this? It, it's impacting Oak Creek that hosts them, but Oak yeah, Creek but o is to the system. But Oak Creek should have the seat at the table in the user group meeting that oh, yes. represents Cudahy and whomever else they right. provide services right. to, and they should be going back to Cudahy and saying, we cannot go live. We, there is high risk here. We're, we're recommending... To the user group that we do not go live or we resolve these companies, but yet there's only like five or six IT departments. That's fine. So we, that's we actually probably better. <laughs> that's actually probably better because you know there's fewer of you to corral. Mm -hmm. That's key, getting everybody on the same. Okay. We'll move on to the technical issues of you. Number six. Oh, sorry. Okay, this was written in December, but it's still valid. Um, Franklin Police Department has received authorization from the Franklin School District uh, to be granted access to their security camera and surveillance system. Security camera and surveillance system uh, group, due to a growing national trend in school violence, it was deemed necessary that this collaboration of resources begin sooner rather than later. Uh, the shared environment uh, should be constructed from existing networks and infrastructure. Uh, instead of waiting for the new fiber optic network to be completed. Uh, sure, uh, instead of waiting for the new fiber optic network to be completed. Uh, Franklin IT will be working with the school district to set up IPsec tunnels and routing between offices, and then gaining access to the interface software necessary to access their surveillance infrastructure. Uh, it is roughly estimated this this project will be completed within about two months. Estimated this this project will be completed within about two months. Uh, a memorandum of understanding and agreements establishing the police policies and procedures is actively being worked on. <clears throat> and that's all I have for technology issues. And the notes on operations upgraded from ProPhoenix 2020 R2 over to the latest version of ProPhoenix 2022. Uh, the vendor has made significant security uh, and feature changes to the product. The PD will request the new RMS and CAD software be placed on new Windows 2022 virtual machines instead of doing an in-place upgrade onto the existing virtual human resource intensive. PD deemed that the implementation is much cleaner and the overall installation is more stable than the traditional in-place upgrade. 2022 server has been built and configured. Uh, the police department is actively user acceptance testing in the environment with an estimated conversion date of February 13th, 2022. <coughs> Uh, it's a lot. <laughs> oh, easily. Uh, now, some of it is, for me, outsourced, but I also have a lot of coordination uh, of it as well, and there's still handled uh, for it, particularly on, on security issues and on database issues directly. Right? That has turnaround and been specified for it. Um, they do like doing um, their work after hours, if at all possible, because we have a a large time zone change. The majority of the uh, support and such is actually done in India. 
uh, for it. So there's obviously a 12 hour uh, be between the two. So there are there is some communication issues that we get because of the time differential. Sometimes a language barrier uh, as well uh, for it. But overall, I'd say it, it's somewhere around between 80 to 100 hour man hours to turn around in a major upgrade. With this. Provisioning hour man hours to turn around in a major upgrade. With this. Provisioning is, is fairly simple for it. It's going through all of the minor details. And there's also a lot of interfaces that we have with ProPhoenix that also have to turn around and be taken into consideration and tested. That's just IT time. That's not even PD time to consideration and tested. That's just IT time. That's not even PD time to user acceptance and testing. So. Did you say it was going to be installed on a physical server and not a virtual? virtual? Okay. Virtual. Two, two, uh, two new VMs. Okay. I misunderstood you. Thank you. Same most. We do split the RMS and the CAD uh, for it. And they're also on their independent volume for it as well. The performance up and running. Uh, historically, it's not been the performance testing, it's a feature that suddenly doesn't work that used to work when you go over to the update. Some of that can't be eaten. That's when you really know what, what's going on for it. So um, the force be with us on that, on that migration. Uh, last point, Rapid7 has been built and deployed while linking the resources to the online cloud environment. Over 270 Rapid7 agents have been manually deployed on and are relaying, and are relaying event and security <coughs> information to the cloud. Uh, building out uh, the on-premise infrastructure was more labor and resource intensive than it was originally estimated. Uh, to date, four on-premise servers uh, and a virtual server appliance needed to be set up and configured even though the product is largely cloud-based and administered in the cloud. Be set up and configured even though the product is largely cloud-based and administered in the cloud. Uh, MDR, uh, uh, Managed Detection and Response, um, going over to the Security Operations Center integration, is moving forward with no significant incidents being detected from a month, month's worth of data. They, we have collected a month's worth of data being detected from a month, month's worth of data. They, we have collected a month's worth of data scattered infrastructure, and fortunately, we haven't seen anything out there. So there's no like ransomware or, or malware that's communicating to a command and control server. We would have thought the penetration test would have picked it up, but they're not seeing anything ever. We would have thought the penetration test would have picked it up, but they're not seeing anything at Rapid7, which they say is actually unusual, which kind of kudos to us for, yeah. for not having that. Uh, the vendor normally monitors the environment for 60 days and corrects existing problems before fully enabling the SOC service. And corrects existing problems before fully enabling the SOC service. Any questions for the director? Uh, Dale, do you have one of these spiffy little packets, items in your packet? I have what? One of these things says yeah. memorandum. Uh, no. No. Uh, Rajiv and I have this. Yep. We have to sign this and return oh, this. Yeah. This is the uh, oh, that's for the clerk's office code of conduct. Code of conduct. I think I received that at home. You got it in the mail. Okay. Can I give this to you? Uh, yeah. Okay. I'll give it to the clerk. Thank you. Um, items update on the fiber network. Um, and I know the memorandum of understanding that for Common Council. I think that's going. On the uh, on for the seventh agenda. Okay. So the, there'll probably be a little bit more about about that. I think that was one of the I, action I uh, on <laughs> for our last day with us was making sure that MOU was actually formalized. Hmm. Yeah, that was a big task. Um, we have the last sections of the strategic technology plan, as Jim said. Uh, risk watch matrix. Uh, risk watch matrix. Vendor fail. Vendor fail. What does that mean? But I think that's whenever we have vendor talking about when we have vendor fails and what, what you do with it, but I kind of like weirdly worded on it. Yeah, I, I'd almost clearly. Yeah, I'd almost clearly. <laughs> teenager wrote it. All right, uh, our next meeting is February 22nd. Does anyone have any other agenda items that we should put on here? Uh, I'm curious to know what the Windows 11 plan 
<laughs> That's why I'm here. <laughs> As most people know, um, unless you buy a, a Windows workstation grade machine, like a PHP yeah, Z2 um, computer with Z out or a high end processor on it, uh, Microsoft has now stopped selling Windows where you buy a computer, you get Windows 11, but then you, you have a downgrade license on it so you can actually put Windows 10 on yep. it. And the manufacturers are now saying, nope, we're no longer providing drivers for that. So if you go out and you buy a new piece of hardware on it, you're getting Windows 11 and only Windows 11. Uh, some discussion about, since we did our original uh, implementation of computers here in three phases. So we bought tranches of computers in three different years to turn around and upgrade the entire environment. Uh, so we weren't doing it all at, at once. This was supposed to be year one where we would buy new, new computers. I'm going to get in trouble when I'm going to look for a car. I can inflation. The price <laughs> of computers from what I originally paid for it, I, 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 it still hasn't come down. So we decided to defer one year. We'll, we'll, we're able to turn around and extend our five year. It's now been five years for, since it was purchased. We can now take it out for one more year for six. So we'll pay the extension of the software maintenance at, uh, for, for one year to carry it out. And we're, we're pushing that out of 2023 and we're putting it into 2024. Now there's probably going to still be a few computers that we're going to be buying. Um, I, I, there's probably going to still be a few computers that we're going to be buying. Um, I, I know one of them is out of the PD where they're getting Microsoft service laptops, and I warned them, you're going to have to turn around and get Windows 10 on that thing. The big issue that I see is Windows 12 is coming out. I don't know if you're aware of that. Windows 12 is coming out. I don't know if you're aware of that. Yeah, yeah. That's supposed to be in 2024. Well, that's one of the reasons why. And right, should Windows 11, which was always been a half baked operating system, be a flyover, which may actually be Windows 11 with all the bugs turned around and fixed out of it? Since we're buying new computers anyways in in 2024. We're looking at maybe not even going to Windows 11 and going straight to Windows 12 and then using that as a catalyst doing a Windows 12 environment on here. It's a sound, I think it's a sound plan as long as you're double sure. Of, Microsoft uh, has Windows of, uh, at least when they release 10, it. Uh, when Windows 10 comes out. Right. If, if they don't make their release deadline, and they're normally pretty good about it. Yeah. And they normally have been doing it, but anything can happen. Yeah. If they don't match their release date, we're in trouble on that. But to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense putting Windows 11 in an environment when you know it's going to be retired in one year. Then you're doing all that work all over again. And then the big question, in order to go to Windows 10 from Windows Trusted Platform Module, TPM is required in Windows 11. Not every computer here has TPM. Are they going to change that requirement in, in Windows 12? It will be now TPM version 2. Blah, 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 with all these blah, 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 blah features to it. All these Windows 11 computers that may not meet the security requirements of Windows 12. To me, it makes more sense to delay the purchase until Windows 12 comes out and they announce their hardware requirements, then make your make your leap. Because that TPM was a, a big obstacle for a lot of companies. and going in with migration. It was a, a big obstacle for a lot of companies in, in going in with migration. Unless they, unless they go with a non-hardware equivalent, you're going to have that issue. Yeah. And it's tough. I mean, they, that was a big problem with virtualization because how do you virtualize the TPM on, on, on a computer? Mm -hmm. How do you run Windows virtualize the TPM on, on, on a computer? Mm -hmm. How do you run Windows 11 on VMware when the with, with the TPM, because the TPM is supposed to install the, complete, the encryption keys for one computer and only one computer. What are you going to do with that environment? And they found a hack that you can go around and doing it. But it kind of eliminates most of the security features if you go ahead and, and turn that on and do it from a virtualization standpoint. So, or you can say, heck with it, we're going with Apple. <laughs> <laughs> All you're doing is trading out problems. <laughs> 
Believe it or not, PD Dispatch would love it. <laughs> um, I think we normally do a motion. So, any oh, motion? Yeah, motion to adjourn. Uh, Second. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Let's go.